Thank you. you. May be seated. My Sunday exercise. Let's take our Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we looked at just a moment ago. We're in Exodus chapter 7, looking at some very important events, not only in the history of the world, but also things that set the example for us, and that's what the New Testament tells us, the example for us so that we might learn what God expects of his people. So we wouldn't fall into the same kinds of sins that they fell into. So that we might learn the way in which God blesses and why he blesses at different times in people's lives and why he withholds his blessing at other times. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In fact, he makes it very clear by making a reference back to the crossing of the Red Sea. We're about to do that. Paul takes us in 1 Corinthians 10 back to the Exodus and explains to us that those things were written for us. When Moses was going through it, he didn't know that was going to be for us. When Aaron was going through it, he didn't know it was going to be for us. When the millions of the people of the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea, they didn't know it was going to be for us. But it specifically says so in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So we have much to learn in terms of practical Christian application from the way in which we see events unfolding before us here as we look at chapter 7. We haven't gotten to the Exodus quite yet. Have to get through the ten plagues. We're looking at plague number one today. But it was written for us. And I think you'll see that as we get a little farther into the text. Now you remember that last week we had Rattlesnake for Lunch, part two. We summarized the relationship of precise obedience, and I emphasize precise obedience, and how it related to Moses' commission to Pharaoh. We saw how obedience was the key to his his rods rattlesnake lunch or Aaron's rods rattlesnake lunch we saw that we were given grace and the spiritual gifts so that we would obey that means it's possible we saw that obedience proves who is your master regardless of what you proclaim with your mouth you can say one thing with your mouth and your life will prove it otherwise third we saw that obedience is the deciding factor in your testimony to the lost because failure to obey means no testimony to the lost number four we saw that genuine faith always results in obedience if it's genuine faith always results in obedience and we asked ourselves the question do you talk the talk but don't walk the walk we saw that obedience begins in your thought life what do you think about when your mind is idle number six we saw that both obedience and disobedience always have consequences you will pay a price or you will get a reward number seven we saw that Jesus Christ set the example and he learned obedience by suffering and we should point out if Jesus learned obedience by suffering, that's the way we will also learn obedience, by suffering. We saw that the end result of sanctification is obedience. That's one of the proofs of spiritual growth over in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. So we saw that precise obedience was the key to what happened in our text last week. We noticed that God gave five very specific commands to Moses in the preceding verses. In verses seven, or excuse me, verses eight through thirteen, right up above that, God gave five specific, very specific commands to Moses. If Moses had not learned to follow his directions precisely, he would have been in very, very bad trouble. And so lesson number one was sloppy obedience is never okay. Lesson one, sloppy obedience is never okay. First, Moses was not to make any action until Pharaoh gave that very specific command. When Pharaoh shall speak unto you, saying, Show a miracle for you. Now, Moses was waiting for some very specific trigger words. And it was not until those words came out that Moses was to do, to do anything. There was a precise timing, a precise key to what brings on the snake show. Moses was not to perform any action until he heard those words show a miracle for you. Secondly, we saw that he, Moses was not to reply to Pharaoh. Moses was supposed to speak to Aaron. It says so specifically in the text. Third, he didn't tell Moses to discuss the problem with Aaron. He says, you're going to give a command to Aaron. Third, very precise thing there in that text. Fourth, and very important, and this was something that I think some of us hadn't perhaps thought about before. The command would relate to Aaron's rod, not to Moses' rod. God told him to tell Aaron to take Aaron's rod and throw it down. Moses already knew that his own rod could become a serpent at the word of God. But now, God was going to use Aaron's rod to show that God is not limited to using one man only. 
God does that kind of thing to keep us from getting proud by showing us how easily he can use somebody else if we wander away from his commands and his ways. Now, of course, God is still going to use Moses' rod to part the Red Sea. God would still use Moses' rod to strike the rock and cause the water to come forth. He would use Moses' rod held over his head, supported by Aaron and Hur, that would give victory over the Amalekites. But God also used Aaron's rod, not only on this occasion, but on a number of other occasions. When there was rebellion in the camp, and the rods of the leaders were laid up before God, it was Aaron's rod that budded almonds and blossoms to show that God had chosen him, even though he was a really Mickey Mouse weak leader. In number 17, it also doubled as the tribal rod for the tribe of Levi, showing that Aaron and his family were the divinely ordained priestly leaders of that entire tribe, as well as of the nation. The fifth thing we learned out of that text from the specific obedience commands, what Aaron did with his rod was specified. It was to be cast down before Pharaoh, which really is giving Pharaoh a personal threat. God did not let Aaron have a practice run with his rod before the test day. How would they know if Aaron's rod would work like Moses' rod? That was a threat to Pharaoh because we know how Moses reacted when his own rod turned into a serpent. He ran like a chicken with his head cut off. That brought us to lesson two. Precise obedience always produces the precise results that God wants. You know, if you go into the chemistry laboratory and you just sort of, well, I guess this is about enough, and I guess, well, this is about enough, and this is about enough. You know what? If you do it different every time, you're going to get a different result every time. God wants precise obedience because he wants precise results. God knows the precisely right formula for getting those results. And so God had given a very precise formula to Moses and Aaron. We found that there were two things. First, the divine response. God had told them, I told you it was going to happen to Pharaoh, and sure enough, that's what happened, so I can judge Pharaoh. You see, God's determined ahead of time going to judge Pharaoh. He didn't hit Pharaoh with something that Pharaoh would be so awed with that Pharaoh would repent, fall on his face right away, and say, you guys go and follow your God. He's going to give ten increasing types of judgment as Pharaoh hardens and hardens and hardens and hardens and hardens his heart. Because God is going to judge Pharaoh. He's not merely going to direct the children of Israel out of Egypt, though he's going to do that in fulfillment of his promises years, hundreds of years before, more than 400 years before, to Abraham, and then to Isaac, and then to Jacob, and then to the patriarchs, when they finally come down in the days of Joseph, being the assistant to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. That was 400 years before we find the Exodus taking place. God will keep his word, but God is going to judge the Egyptians. And so God says, do it my way. That's the goal that I want to have. And then, of course, we saw the results in terms of the response of the human reaction. We see fear. We see the Pharaoh and his magicians coming up with a human solution with a demonic duplication. We find the hardening of the heart. We find the rejection of the command of God. That brought us to the third lesson. The third lesson that we saw last week is that the activity on earth that we can see is merely a visible playing out of Satan's long war against God. I love that phrase, the long war against God. Henry Morris, the great creationist, wrote a book, The Long War Against God. I encourage you to get it and read it sometime. But that's what it is. It's the long war against God. And what you see playing out on earth, right now even, is the visible manifestation of the invisible realm of the long war against God. That's what's happening right now. Satan's trying to get God to break just one of his promises. If he can beat God just once, he wins. We are also engaged in this spiritual warfare. We didn't read this passage last week, so I'm going to read it now and comment on how this may play out in your life, just like it did in the life of Moses. Remember, this is very important. Moses and Aaron had victory because they obeyed precisely sloppy obedience is never okay. The reason they had victory was because they obeyed precisely. Now here's the passage out of Ephesians chapter 6 that puts it in context for us. Finally, my brethren, which means if this is finally, that's what you should take it as. This should be the last word on the subject. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Don't walk in the flesh. Don't use the world's methods. Be strong in the Lord 
and in the power of his might, walk in the spirit. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, and against, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Did you get that? You're not wrestling against the governor or the lieutenant governor or the local town council. You're not wrestling against the Supreme Court of the United States. You're not wrestling against the, the president or the vice president of the United States. You're not wrestling against senators and representatives. They are merely manifestations of a spiritual battle that is going on in the heavenly places. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Did you hear that? but against principalities. And he gives you here four different levels of military command. These words are used of different levels of military command. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. If you could see them, do you think you might tremble in your boots? I think I would. God in his grace doesn't let us see them, but it is real. It's going on all around us right now. That's what Moses was wrestling against. New Testament makes mention of those two magicians, Jonas and Jambres. God won. Just remember, God wins. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Now think about this for a minute. If you leave off one piece of this armor, where do you think the devil's going to attack you? Will he attack you where you got your armor on? He's going to attack you where you don't have your armor on. Take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, three times in a row. Stand. You're not to run. You're not to turn your back. You're to stand. Having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. That's your communication with headquarters. That's your, your two-way radio, if you will. And watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. Suppose you wore it all except you didn't have your loins girt about with truth. Where is the devil going to attack your loins? What if you don't have on the breastplate of righteousness? you got everything else on, but you don't have the breastplate of righteousness. What's he going to head for your heart? What if you don't have your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace? He doesn't even have to whip out a sword. All he has to do is throw tacks on the ground. And you're going to be dancing around there. Oh, my feet, my feet, my feet. You get it? It's the whole armor of God. Satan will attack you where you don't have the armor on. If Moses had disobeyed God, you know where Satan would have attacked him? Where he didn't have his armor on. This is practical for us, folks. Praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit. Not... You know, you throw up a, a flare player just once in a while when you're in trouble. This is the continual, habitual practice of prayer. Paul says so over in First Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. That's the attitude of prayer. The lines of communication are always open. You never close down the lines of communication. You are always available to be in the presence of God instantaneously with communication. You're always meditating upon his word no matter what you're doing. You're saying, how does the word of God apply to this situation that I'm, that I'm finding myself in, that I'm about to talk, and what, what am I supposed to say based on the word of God? My thoughts that are running through my mind are those in conformity with what the word of God has to say. It's very important. The helmet of salvation, that's your mind, is protected. And the sword of the spirit, that's the only offensive weapon you have in this entire list. Everything else is defensive which is the Word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication of the Spirit, and watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints, and for me. You need to be praying for others, and especially for those who are on the front lines of proclaiming the Gospel. That utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the Gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Folks, remember, this is no joke. 
These were degenerate, wicked, demon-possessed sorcerers with supernatural powers that Moses was going up against. They were able to duplicate that miracle of the rod. We're going to see they were able to duplicate the miracle of blood. Now, you know, it's always struck me sort of funny and as I looked at this first plague here. You know, Moses, you know, and Aaron, everything turns to blood. And so, you know, it would have been a whole lot more helpful if the magicians could have turned blood into water. <laughs> it's very unhelpful for them to turn more water into blood. That didn't do much good for Pharaoh, did it? If they wanted to show their power, they should have turned some blood into water. But they couldn't do that. They couldn't reverse the miracle that God had produced. You know, um, some of you probably saw, I, I walked through some place, I don't remember, it was an airport or where it was playing up on the screen, Prince of Egypt. Uh, it was a cartoon version of the, of the Ten Commandments and the Exodus. Did any of you all ever see that? Some, some of you saw that. Well, it, it's a cartoon version, and I didn't see much of it, but it was right at the point where Moses was throwing down uh, his rod, or Aaron throwing down his rod, but in the film I think it was Moses threw down the rod, and um, turns into a snake. But the magicians are dancing around and they're singing a song, and it still sticks in my head, you're playing with the big boys now. In other words, we are tough. You better be careful. You're just a little nobody. You're a has-been. Well, maybe so, but Moses had the God of the universe behind him. Just remember that. It doesn't matter if you're playing with the big boys now because you've got one who's even bigger than the big boys behind you. If you want victory, when you enter this particular contest, you must be wearing all the spiritual armor that God has provided for your protection. Not just wearing it, you have to know how to use the only offensive weapon that you have in your arsenal, the Word of God. So the question is, are you reading it? Are you studying it? Are you memorizing it? Are you meditating upon it? And one of the great ways I've found for meditating upon the Word of God is to pray the Word of God back to God. As you pray, you quote scripture. Because it's God's word, and God's word never returns void. It accomplishes that which he pleases and prospers in the thing whereto he has said it. Do you pray the scripture? It's a great way to meditate. It certainly will direct your prayer life. You know, most of us lead flabby, musty, messy, trivial, mediocre lives of spiritual insignificance, ineptitude, and defeat. And we think that that must be the normal Christian life. It's not the normal Christian life. We've hung out so long in the latrine that we've become adapted to and have begun to enjoy the stench. Friends, we're in God's army. We're his soldiers. We need to breathe deeply of the fragrant air of heaven. We need to plant our feet solidly on the ground with our face to the enemy. We need to steel our souls to precise obedience to the word of God. We need to boldly resist the enemy, armed by the Spirit of God. We need to press forward with resolve. No turning back. No turning back. You know the hymn. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. That should be the soldier of Christ who says that. The fourth lesson we learned was that Satan can counterfeit the miracles of God because he does have supernatural power. But he does not have omnipotent power. His power is always less than the power of God. That's proved by what happened to the snakes of the magicians. They became lunch for Aaron's rod. That was the rattlesnake lunch. It's clear that Satan does have supernatural powers to produce deceptive miracles. We looked at Simon the sorcerer in Acts chapter 8 and many references to Satan's miracles in the book of Revelation by which he will someday deceive the entire world. The Bible makes it clear that Satan and his demons have supernatural power. We saw that Satan has greater power than even Michael the archangel in Jude 1 verse 9. Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Takes us back there. What's happening at the Exodus? Demonic warfare. Nurse not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. And there's coming a day, however, when Michael will defeat Satan in that final angelic conflict in Revelation chapter 12. I didn't read it last week. I'm going to read it to you now because I want you to see the devil is a defeated foe. And even Michael, who is less powerful than Satan, 
who had to say, the Lord rebuke you when he argued about the body of Moses. There's coming a day when Michael is going to be the leader of God's host that defeats Satan. There was a war in heaven. This is Revelation 12, beginning in verse 7. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, and prevailed not, neither was his place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So we know who we're talking about. Let me just pause for a moment. Too many people say, oh, well, you can allegorize the book of Revelation away because, you know, you've got all those symbols and you can make those symbols mean whatever you want them to mean. And um, I remember years ago hearing uh, a man who now knows better, he's in heaven with the Lord, on the radio who liked to allegorize the Bible away. And he had a, a program that people called into, and you probably know who I'm talking about. But he, he made the comment that when it said in the book of Revelation, a third of the ships were destroyed, a third of the ships in the sea were destroyed, he said, well now, ships carry good things, and uh, ships were means by which uh, the apostles traveled, and so ships were the means by which the gospel was spread, and so therefore it means a third of the gospel witnesses. Wait a minute. Where do you get that? Every one of the symbols in the book of Revelation is explained somewhere else in Scripture. Some of them right in the immediate context. So if you're wondering about the dragon, if you're wondering about the serpent, it tells you who it is. Verse 9, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. Every symbolic figure that's used in the book of Revelation. It's talking about real events. It does use symbolic language, but all the symbols are explained somewhere else in Scripture. You don't have to guess. You don't have to make it up. You don't have to allegorize it. It is explained in Scripture. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ for the accuser of our brethren. There's another one of his names. He's the accuser of the brethren. He is cast down which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto the death. Do you realize we're involved in a war? They loved not their lives unto the death. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. Folks, what you see around you is merely the visible manifestation of a great long war against God that is taking place in the heavenlies. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast out unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And that is not the Roman Catholic Church. That is Israel. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. That's three and a half years. When you study the book of Revelation, you find that phrase occurring several times. It's three and a half years. From the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, that was extra added from last week. Didn't get that last week. Lesson five that we learned. We do not have to be afraid as believers because the power of God is greater than the power of devil. 1 John 4, 4, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. God can always make lunch meat out of rattlesnakes. Just make sure you're obeying if you want it to happen. That's brought us to today. It sure doesn't taste like cranberry juice. <laughs> the blood of the water of Egypt that was turned from water to blood. This is, lesson is going to be divided into two parts. I'm going to do the first half today, the Lord willing, the second half next week. This first half, I'm going to be dealing with fruit inspectors. First half of the lesson is fruit inspectors. You say, well, what in the world has that got to do with turning the, the water to blood? You'll see in just a moment. The first lesson that we learn in our text, which is down here, uh, verses 14 through 25, is that something happened right in that very first verse where God talked to Moses. And God told Moses something that Moses already knew. Moses couldn't see Pharaoh's heart. He could only see his external response. It was obvious from that response that Pharaoh had hardened his heart. But did you notice that God also confirmed to Moses what Moses could already see? Now, I think there's a very important lesson in that. You might just 
jump right over it without thinking about it. If you don't meditate on that verse for a few minutes, you know what's happening here? We don't have to rely on our fallible senses only. The real truth will always be confirmed by the Word of God. You don't have to guess at it. God will always confirm the truth with His Word. If you're puzzled about something, you know where you go for the confirmation? You don't go to your friends. Uh, you don't go to psychology. You don't go to the great philosophers of history. You go to the Word of God. You may perceive something with your senses, and it seems right, but the confirmation comes in the Word of God. I know some of you have seen sleight of hand tricks that magicians do. Now, they're a sleight of hand in addition to demonic powers, and sleight of hand, and I used to be able to do some of these. I don't have anything with me right now to do it, but you can take a marble. I can make a marble disappear. I can put the marble in this hand, and it's you know not there. It turns out to be in this hand, or I can take a marble and put it in this hand, and I pull it out of my ear. Uh, I used to be able to do stuff like that. Now, I don't do it anymore. It, it borders too much on the, the stuff that you shouldn't do. Uh, so, But sleight of hand type of stuff. You think you saw it, you think you know it, but it isn't real. The guy who pulls the rabbit out of the hat. Don't rely on your senses. God gives us an illustration of that here. Moses could have relied on his senses, but God confirms what the truth is. And God will always confirm to you from his word what the truth is. I think that's rather important. Why is the, the world so opposed to this principle? Well, I'll tell you. That's why the Bible gives us the lesson of the fruit inspectors. Sitting Christians hate the idea of fruit inspectors. I remember their objections in college. You know, somebody would try to be sneaking out of the dorm at night to uh, go over the girls' dorm, and some of these guys could actually climb the outside of the building uh, to get up to the windows. And um, I would rebuke them and tell them, you do that and I'm going to report you to the prefect. And uh, they would say to me, so what makes you think God made you a fruit inspector? Or judge not that she be ju not judged. Have you ever, has anybody ever thrown that to your face? Yeah. <laughs> People throw that at you all the time, don't they? You know, the problem with that is they fail to read what Jesus said in the very next verse. That's from Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 and 2. Judge not that she be not judged. And they stop there. But verse 2 says, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. In other words, Jesus wasn't saying that you can never judge. He's saying that you don't be a hypocrite when you judge, because otherwise you'll get slapped with the same standard that you're judging with. In fact, we find in the New Testament specific cases mentioned where we must judge for the sake of the purity of the church. For example, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It throws the first half, and you're going to see how this ties in with Moses and turning the water to blood in just a moment, I hope. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. Now, that's a gross sin. That's really, really gross. Even the Gentiles didn't practice that. And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he hath that done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, now listen to the next three words, have judged already. Was Paul violating what Jesus said not to do in Matthew chapter 7? No, he was not. I have judged already, as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to do some judging. Deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Did you know the church can do that? They have somebody in the church who's involved in some kind of wickedness, some kind of sin, pretending to be a Christian, pompously showing up for church services, and living in sin of some kind. Maybe he's a tax evader. Maybe he's a fornicator or an adulterer. Maybe he's a thief. Maybe he's a blasphemer. It doesn't matter what the sin is. But he's just cranking right along, and everybody's just sort of grinning. They know it's back there, but they don't know what to say because he's a powerful person. You know, Paul says you judge him. In fact, you don't just judge him. You turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Satan loves that. He would love to rip into you. It's a good reason not to get involved in sin.
If you get turned over to Satan, he will kill you. You'll still be saved. He says so here a little bit later. It says, The destruction of the flesh of the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. It's a saved person we're talking about. A saved person who's involved in this immorality. And you know what? God says, The final instrument of chastening that I'm going to use on that person, I'm going to let the devil get at him. Turn him over. Don't pray for him, around him, about him. Turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glorying is not good. Here they were pompously saying, Oh, let us sin that grace may abound. Paul deals with that issue in Romans. But the Corinthians were living it. I mean, they were full of all kinds of sins in the church at Corinth. The first nine verses of 1 Corinthians are the only commendation that he gives to him, and the rest of the book deals with all the problems and sins in the, in the church at Corinth. I mean, they had everything. They had people suing each other at courts of law among the Christians. I mean, they had horrible stuff going on. Know ye not that a little leaven leaven with the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven. That's judgment, that you may be a new lump. As ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Now, he says, here's the practical application. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Yet not altogether with the fornicators of the world, or with the covetous, or with the extortionists, or with the idolaters, for then you must needs go out of the world. He says, you know, if you're going to have any impact at all in the world, you're going to come across unsaved people who live in those horrible, wicked sins. That's the point. Christ died for sinners. We're supposed to try to reach them. But God changes lives. He takes you as he finds you, but he never leaves you as he finds you. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. That's judging. You have to make a discernment. You have to say, I'm going to separate from that person. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. Hmm. Did you know there are Christians who commit fornication? And adultery? And there's some that do it on a quite regular basis. And some of them do it physically. And some of them do it, do it through pornography. Jesus said, if you lust after a woman, look on her to lust after her, you've committed adultery with her already in your heart. Hmm. You think this would apply to somebody who, who spends time looking at pornography? I think so. That's serious, folks. Or covetous? Whoa! Doesn't that slap us all upside the head? Covetous! You see, Paul says in Ephesians 5.5 5 and Colossians 3.5 that covetousness is idolatry. Do you understand why God says you as a body of believers are supposed to separate from somebody who's covetous? He's somebody who's practicing, as far as God is concerned, he's practicing idolatry. Uh, we don't have any statues up here at the front. If we did, I would burn them or you would fire me. <laughs> Get rid of the statues. You know, We're not going to do that. But you know, we can have covetousness in our hearts. We can have a little teeny weeny itty bitty St. Christopher plastic statue stuck over in the corner somewhere. Be careful, folks. Fornicator, covetous, or an idolater. Those two are parallel. Or a railer. Somebody who screams and yells about other people. Or a drunkard. Or an extortioner. Somebody who rips other people off. With such and one, no, not to eat. You don't even have a ham sandwich with them. And by the way, you can have ham sandwiches now. Every creature of God is good and nothing can be refused. We receive thanksgiving for it is sanctified by the word of God in prayer. With such and one, no, not to eat. You must judge in order to act. You cannot act in the way that Paul commands here unless you judge first. For what am I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within. You're supposed to be doing it. But them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person that's judgment, being carried out by the church. Now, there are 184 mentions of fruit in the Bible. Sometimes it refers to the natural fruit that grows on trees, but often it refers to the visible manifestations of what is in the heart of man. Moses could see the fruit of Pharaoh's response, but God confirmed what was in Moses' heart, uh, in Pharaoh's heart, with the word of God. That's the practical application. God does that for us. We can examine the fruit of a person's life and lips and compare it with the word of God, which will show us what's in that person's heart. 
Most Christians don't realize how big the issue of lifestyle fruit is in the Bible. I'm going to give you just a couple of Old Testament illustrations. Jesus used this illustration over and over and over again in all four Gospels. The issue of fruit. All four Gospels, Jesus talked about, you can tell what people are like by their fruit. What shows up in their lives? The visible representation of the inner man. Let me give you just a couple out of the Old Testament first. In Psalm 1, a beautiful one, it tells you what kind of fruit God produces when someone loves his word. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. That's separation in verse 1. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Now you can't see at night. How are you going to meditate day and night if you have to be able to read it and you don't have it memorized? How? You can't meditate on it. But you're supposed to be meditating on God's Word. Only way is if you've memorized it day and night. And he shall be like a tree. Listen, verse 3, here it is. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, soaking up that water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. It's going to change what comes out of the branches. It won't be like the apostates whose fruit withereth twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Jude talks about them. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's the kind of fruit you and I want to bear. Psalm 92, verses 12 through 15. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. That's why God lets fruit show up in your life. It's to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock. There is no unrighteousness in him. Book of Proverbs talks about it. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Jeremiah 17.10 I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins to give to every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. What's showing up in your life? What kind of fruit? God is going to give you according to the fruit of your doings. I wish we had time to talk about it. You know how many places it talks about rewards? And I've covered this in the past, so I'm not going to cover it today. How many times in the past I've talked about rewards in relation to our works? Your salvation is by grace through faith. Your heavenly rewards are according to your works. Jeremiah is telling us that here. Jesus, or John the Baptist, speaking in Matthew chapter 3, bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. In other words, what fits repentance? You say you've repented. You say you've trusted Christ. You say you've turned from your sins. What's showing up in your life? What kind of fruit do you have? And now also the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Matthew 3, verses 8 through 10. Jesus' words in Matthew 7. You shall know them by their fruits. Here are the fruit inspectors. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, verse 20, wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. God confirms in his word what you see going on around you. That's what he did with Moses. Great illustration! And that's what's foundational for what takes place in the judgment of the water being turned to blood. I wish I could read you these other passages. I'll just mention where they're located for those who may be taking notes. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Matthew 13, 8. Matthew 13, 23. Matthew 13, 26. Matthew 21, 19. Matthew 21, 34. Do you realize that every one of these is dealing with fruit? In some cases, it's the individual fruit. In some cases, it's fruit from the nation Israel. That's some of these passages here deal with Israel not producing fruit when the Messiah came. In the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 4, verses uh, 7 through 29. Mark chapter 11, uh, verse 14. Mark 12, 2. Luke 3, 6, 8, 13, 20. John chapter 4, verse 36. He that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit unto eternal life, that both he that soweth and they that reapeth may rejoice together. John 15, it's all about fruit. Fruit that you and I are supposed to bear. 
Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. And the branch is supposed to be doing what? It's supposed to be bringing forth fruit. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. You walk in the flesh, you're not going to bear fruit. You walk in rebellion, you're not going to bear fruit. You follow the ways of the devil, you're not going to bear fruit. You have to abide in Christ, not bop in and out. You abide in Christ, and you bear fruit. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. First he talks about bringing forth fruit. Then he talks about bringing forth more fruit. Now he talks about bringing forth much fruit. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. And then he talks about bringing forth remaining or abiding fruit. Verse 16, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain. Fruit. Then we find much fruit. Then we find abiding fruit. Paul talks about the kind of fruit we used to bear. The fruit had ye in those things when you are now ashamed for the end of those things is death. Oh, Romans 6, Romans 7, Galatians 5, that's the fruit of the Spirit, you know it, verses 22 and following. Ephesians 5 parallels that, verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. We're supposed to be filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ, Philippians 1.11. We find that Hebrews chapter 12, when we are chastened, it brings forth peaceable fruit of righteousness. We find that we're to give the sacrifice of praise, the fruit of our lips, which is the giving of thanks. We find in James that we're to be full of mercy and good fruits. And the next verse, in the fruit of righteousness is sown of peace in them that make peace. Jude talks about those who have no fruit, because they are trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, in Jude verse 11. Well, that brings us to the second half. I got through, believe it or not, the first half, which was fruit inspectors. We see that being illustrated for us in verse 1 with Moses. The second half deals with the blood. The first plague. Why blood? Did you realize that there are some very important reasons why God chose blood for the very first one of the plagues? He could have chosen lice for the first plague. He didn't do it. He could have chosen the, you know, the, the gnats for the first plague. He, didn't do it. he could have chosen frogs for the first plague. Uh, plague. He didn't do it. Why did he choose blood? There are some very, very important reasons why God chose blood, and the Lord willing, we'll look at those next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for your word and for its power. Help us to be precise in our obedience, because that produces precise results that you have determined. It also helps us to avoid chastening, and it helps us to avoid embarrassment. Help us to be precisely obedient. And then as we are precisely obedient, we see that your word confirms that you fulfill your word precisely and exactly like you said you would. Then help us to understand that our precise obedience is necessary because as we obey, we demonstrate the fruits of righteousness. We can inspect what takes place in the world around us where there's a lot of deception going on, where there is a lot of demonic activity going on, where there's a great spiritual warfare going on, we can ex inspect what is coming out in the lives of those around us as we compare it with the Word of God and can tell whether or not what they say with their lips is really the truth of what's in their heart, because by their fruit we'll know them. Oh, Father, there are many, many in religious circles today, especially in the charismatic movement, who are doing all kinds of signs and wonders. And yet we see the horrendous, horrible fruit in their lives, all kinds of horrible immorality and other wicked things going on, and they'll drop out for a few weeks or months and then come right back in as though nothing had happened. Father, we read about that daily in the newspaper, hear about it on television and radio. The world mocks those people and mocks Christianity as a result. Satan has done his job of deceiving. 
Help us, Father, to demonstrate by the way in which we live, by the fruit that we bear, that we are under the control of your Holy Spirit, that we are bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Help us to bear the fruit of righteousness. Help us, Father, as we do so, to have the sweet savor and taste of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who is the vine, we are the branches, and every branch that abides in him bears fruit. It bears more fruit, then it bears much fruit, then it bears abiding fruit. Father, we pray that you'll take your word as it has been proclaimed this day, use it in our hearts, apply it as only your Holy Spirit can do. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn today is number 588, and much in harmony with what we have just been um, 